thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Again, I apologize for uh, this issue here on my end, I guess, but um, today is going to be, I hope, a fun day. I know some of you have taught economics for several years, and hopefully you'll have some new um, insights that you can use into the classroom, and hopefully for your personal life. I've entitled this, uh, How Economics Can Help You, and then, of course, help your students make better decisions. Uh, some of you might, I tell my students, might change your, uh, your dating status um, after being in this webinar. I won't go through this background. I taught high school for many years as well, almost 15 years, and I'm currently in, in San Jose, outside of San Jose, California, where I teach um, at San Jose State and De Anza College in Cupertino, right down from Apple. So I am an economics professor, former high school teacher, uh, but I'm, I'm not Hitch, but it's okay. If you saw the movie Hitch, it looks like Will Smith should go back and uh, study his character the way his uh, life is going, but I'm not Hitch. I'm not Dr. Phil. Uh, but hopefully I will give you some good things to think about. Uh, my goals for today are to teach and review some basic concepts. Again, forgive me for those of you who've taught econ for a while, but many times these webinars, you have teachers who are brand new to teaching econ and do not have an econ background. Um, how we can use this subject to understand dating and relationships. And at the end, I'll give you a few resources that you can share with your students. I always found it helpful to actually have something tangible to take from seminars, workshops, uh, when I attended these uh, many years ago as well. So those are hopefully the goals that will be attained at the end of today. Uh, my slogan, as opposed to match.com, which claims that no other website has led to more marriages, I like to claim because every semester I get one email uh, and every quarter where I teach at both schools from at least one student telling me that they have broken up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. I think I've had five engagements called off. <laughs> I have a lot of parents who are thanking me. I tell my students, if you pay attention to my in my class, I will save you years of therapy, future divorce fees, because I think no other professor has broken up more relationships or prevented more marriages. I'm going to trademark that. I always say, and I haven't gotten a lawyer to do that yet. Better to be single than in a bad dating relationship. It's okay to be single. It's okay to be single. Let me repeat that again. It's okay if tomorrow night you're at home watching Netflix. That might be better than being with that person, wasting your time and perhaps money. So first of all, what is economics? It's not the study of money. It's the study of human action. It's the study of people making choices. I always like to say nothing is free. That's the F word in my class. So we need to distinguish between the word price and the word cost. So in everyday language, we'll say something like, you know, I got it for free or that cup of coffee cost me $5. And I want you to get into the habit and your students into the habit but anytime that they're referring to money, say the price of the latte is $5. The cost is the sandwich I could have purchased instead with that same $5. Plus, of course, the maybe 10 minutes I waited in line that I could have been studying, spending with someone else, etc. So if you ever get it for free, I tell my students, say I got it for a zero price, but there's never a zero cost. There's no free this, free that. And it's not a political statement, but uh, that's something for a different topic. So price versus cost. And of course, you know what Tan Stoppel stands for. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And I love getting those from my colleagues. And I tell them it's actually a zero price lunch. And then they tell me, well, you know, tell us to uh, remind us to remove you off the email because economics irritates people, but it does bring um, light and truth to uh, in many situations. So opportunity costs, I think most of you know, but it's not everything you could be doing. It's the next best or the highest valued alternative you sacrifice. Uh, we're going to talk about today how benefits and costs are individual, subjective, how your actions speak louder than words, right? What's the phrase? Talk is cheap. And we call that revealed preference. So when people say, you know, I got ripped off as they voluntarily bought something, I would argue, no, you didn't. Because if you thought you were being ripped off, you wouldn't have waited in line, driven to Starbucks in the first place to get that latte. A marginal means additional or extra. And we need to distinguish between total value we get from something and the extra value by eating that one extra slice of pizza, taking that one extra sip of water, or dating that person that one extra week, that one extra month, whatever that one extra is, that's what we mean by uh, marginal. My old professor um, at George Mason, Walter Williams, he told us a story where he had, I think it was his 40th anniversary dinner planned with his wife, some, something like this, some, a very special anniversary. And at the last minute, a group of his army friends 
were getting together, which was a very unusual situation. And it happened to be the evening of his anniversary. So he had, he shared this story with us and this is 20 plus years ago. So it's, you know, close enough to this story. And he asked us, well, what do you think I did now? If you know him, like we do, I do now where he sadly passed away a few years ago, I would know the answer, but most of my classmates said, well, of course you went to your anniversary dinner with your wife. You didn't know him. He actually went with his friends. And he said that his wife said to him, Walter, you love your friends more than you love me. And his response was, well, tonight I do. Now, what did he mean? What did he not mean? I, by the way, I don't say that stuff to my wife. So I tell my students, sometimes I keep the econ in my head. But what he meant was in total, of course, I love you more. But this is such an unusual situation at the margin it's worth it to me to spend time with these friends because it might not happen ever again, perhaps. So that's the difference between total value and marginal value or utility. I think you know the song, the Pina Colada song, I Was Tired of My Lady, We've Been Together Too Long, like a worn out recording of a favorite song. Basically, what's the guy saying? I'm bored of you. Right now at the end, you know, it's beautiful. They get back together. You know, they realize, you know, that they're each other's true love. But my hope, too, is using music. There's so much out there in the movies that you can use specifically with this topic to teach um, economics concepts. So this is one song from 1979, right? Rupert Holmes, uh, the Pina Colada song. It's an example of the law of diminishing marginal utility. Each extra month you're with this person, perhaps, you're getting less and less utility or value. Uh, dating is what I call IA, not AI. We keep hearing about AI, AI, AI webinars, whatever. I'm over it. <laughs> IA, dating is information acquisition. It's not very romantic, but basically, if your goal is marriage, now people date for various reasons, but let's assume that uh, you or Think about your past if you're married now or to share with your students. If they're ever in a situation one day in their life where they're like, you know what, I would like to get married. I'm ready in my career, my education, whatever, to be married. What is dating? And by the way, some cultures, they uh, arrange marriages and they tend to last longer. But let's assume a, a dating culture. What is dating? It's information acquisition. And be honest, right? Here's the question. When you propose one day, or remember when you did propose, or when you accepted or will accept the proposal one day, is the information you have about that person perfect? In other words, when I proposed to my wife, was my information about her perfect? <laughs> no. Was her information about me perfect? Yes. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But it was what? Good enough. And so I tell my students, and I'm sure you do this as well in other situations, if you're waiting for perfect information before you make a decision, you and I will never make a decision. We live in a world of imperfect information. And getting information also is not free. You get to a point where you do research, or in this case, dating is acquiring information. And you get to a point where you say good enough is good enough. And you have two options. On the left-hand side, you have the movie with Ryan Reynolds and uh, Sandra Bullock. Um, Ryan's wife is hanging out a lot with uh, uh, Taylor Swift at Kansas City game. So I don't know, it might be the breakup here <laughs> next by next year. But that's the proposal. And on the other side, you see Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn in a, in a movie called The Breakup. Both of those movies can be shown by that graph. That's, this is the first graph that I teach uh, that I taught when I taught uh, AP Econ. Uh, if you teach regular Econ, I, I, I definitely didn't make it very technical. I made it uh, even more intuitive. But this is a good, simple graph to teach. The green line, of course, the negatively sloped line, each extra, let's say, month. You know, you could do the increments and whatever. Uh, some people I know date in increments of seconds and they're in a relationship broken up. And next thing you know, social media, they're in another relationship. Whatever it is, let's say in months, each extra month, you get less and less benefit in terms of information. Marginal costs, of course, are the other side, right? It's like two blades of a scissor. Marginal costs start off low, but each extra month they increase. And you notice where the two lines intersect. That's where they're equal to each other. So when Ryan Reynolds proposed, when I think it was Jennifer Aniston broke up with Vince Vaughn's character, they reached this point of equilibrium. Why not date an extra month? Because any extra benefit 
of getting new information would be less than the marginal cost. Maybe they didn't want to spend another month delaying starting their life together. And in this situation, the breakup, the thinking was, I don't want to date you one extra month because any marginal benefit uh, uh, would be higher also uh, or be, would be lower than the marginal cost. And I don't want to waste my time. You don't want to stop too soon. You don't want to go too far. You stop when it's just right. So this one graph explains both situations, the proposal and the breakup. Make wise choices. Don't be these people. So this was Alex Rodriguez, you know, New York Yankee, A-Rod, not that long ago, smiling. This is him today. Ben Affleck, after the first time, you see that face of pain. Again, Benifer, right? They just did, I guess, a commercial for the Super Bowl, Dunkin' Donuts commercial. I didn't see that one, but I heard it was a good one. Okay. And I wish them the best by next Valentine's Day. This will be his face again. Now, full disclosure, I did say this last Valentine's Day. So um, let's see if I'm right by next Valentine's Day. I hope not. I wish them well, but don't be shocked if this is his face by next year. And by the way, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. And yeah, J-Lo is winning. So anyways, that's a different topic. Oh, yeah, I know you're all sick of this, right? This is Taylor smiling. This is Travis smiling, right? Super Bowl, new relationship. I wish them well. This will be them. Give it about six months. Now that real life is starting, they're not just traveling back and forth. The Eros tour is done. The Kansas City Chiefs are done, at which I'm glad I live in the in San Francisco Bay Area, but I'm a Cowboys fan, so I'm glad <laughs> the Niners lost. Sorry. Don't mark that on my evaluation, but Travis is smiling now, but as they spend more and more time together in all seriousness, they're going to get to each, know each other more. It's not going to be just these little, you know, flying out here for a weekend or whatever. And as you get to know each other, you never know. This will be them next year. Taylor will still be smiling and she'll write a song about their breakup. And <laughs> this might be his career ending. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. How do you know somebody likes you, like really likes you, or thinks you're worth that, uh, their precious, valuable time based on what day of the week they choose to spend with you? So you can ask your students this. Are each of your nights equally valuable? In other words, are your Mondays, Tuesdays just as valuable as Fridays and Saturdays? And of course, the stereotypical answer is no. Stereotypically, Fridays and Saturdays are our prime nights, the nights you know you want to go out, have a good time, spend time with that special someone, spend time with someone you're hoping will be a special someone. So this little thing here that you see here, this little picture, I'd like to elevate you from a Wednesday to a Saturday. That's implying that, hey, that's a compliment. You're worth a Saturday. And you know that this person thinks that this person is worth more since they're giving up a Saturday night. So I have what are called Monday, Tuesday, coffee, lunch people versus Friday, Saturday, dinner, movie people. So for example, now I'll use myself as an example. Not that this ever happened to me. Would you like to go to dinner on a Saturday night and, and go see a Sharks game, right? The hockey team here in San Jose, close to where I live. No Ninos, but right? That three letter word, which is like a dagger in the heart, right? Because if, there, if, if you wanted to, there would be no but, right? But how about, you know, I have to study tonight. How about we do Monday coffee instead? Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, okay, I got, I got a, you know, a coffee at least, but okay, fine. Maybe it's a big test or what have you. A few weeks later, let's say there's a play, uh, you know, about an hour, hour and a half away. Hey, I got tickets to this play. Would you like to go? And afterwards we can go to dinner. I'd love to, but I have to wake up, you know, and go running in the morning. How about we do Tuesday lunch instead? Okay, after a while, you got to start thinking about this way. Either this person is really studying hard for something. Uh, they're training for the Boston Marathon, apparently. I missed that one. Or what this person is saying, just like a movie uh, years, a few years ago, he's not, you could say she's not that into you. Basically, in this hypothetical never happened story, you want me to give up a Friday night to go to dinner and a movie, I'm sorry, a dinner and a movie or a Saturday night to go to a play or to go to a hockey game and dinner. Those are like five, six hour events. I'm not giving up five or six hours of my precious valuable Friday or Saturday. Meeting up for coffee on a Monday, you know what, after about an hour, it's reasonable to say nice to see you. 
uh, you know, uh, Tuesday lunch, I have to eat anyway, you know, and after an hour, again, I have a legitimate excuse, I, you know, I have to go back to work. And let's be blunt, usually on Mondays and Tuesdays, stereotypically, we don't have much better things to do anyway. So what I call Fridays and Saturdays are high opportunity cost nights, Mondays and Tuesdays are what are called low opportunity cost times. There are people in my phone, if they call me now, I'm married, I have two little kids, you know, would you like to go around on a Friday night or Saturday? That is very rare because now my priorities are spending time at home. When I was not married, did not have children, there were some people, do you want to hang out on Friday or Saturday? I would say, I'm sorry. Others, I'd say absolutely, because it depended. And people did the same thing to me. Uh, there are some people, would you like to meet up for coffee? Sure. How about... Uh, <laughs> you know, room uh, or F21K, which is my my office uh, on, on, on Tuesday or Thursday. What I'm basically saying is I, I have to be on campus anyway. So if you want to meet up, sure, because the opportunity cost is very, very low. Uh, if your students get excited about someone wanting to have lunch with them and it's during the school day, uh, that's not that big of a deal. So you know, if a student said, you know, way back when, let's pretend, Mr. Malik, you know, uh, you know, she, she's going to have lunch with me. I'm like, OK, that's great. And usually people get, you know, very bold on Fridays when they want to ask someone out, uh, just like politicians put out the bad news on Friday. Right. So people forget about the weekend. And so how about would we meet up for lunch? And I thought, OK, well, that's great. So where are you going tomorrow, meaning Saturday? Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to have lunch today. Well, you're going to have lunch today here at school where you have to be anyway. She doesn't really like you like you because the opportunity cost of having lunch where you kind of have to be anyway is very low. Now, if someone's willing to give up a weekend day, that's a different thing. So economics might sound like crushing, but it also can be very liberating and it also can help you separate who really likes you like you as just a friend which, uh, you know, back in my, oh, you're just a friend. It's like, I already have enough friends. Or if somebody thinks that you're, you're worth more, okay? It's a signal. So if you call someone always for a Friday, Saturday, get together, and they always respond with Monday or Tuesday, get the hint, stop wasting your time. Texting. I remember, I mean, I'm going to be 53 in August here. So I remember the 70s, you know, early 80s, you pick up the phone. Hello. There was no caller ID. Hello. Like, mm, and you fake it, right? Academy Award winner acting, actor, you know, smiling. Oh, hey, how are you? Now, how many times have you done this when somebody calls? I love seeing, you know, that caller ID on my screen. Because what I'll do sometimes is I'll let it go to voicemail. And you've done the same thing. And if you're nice enough to acknowledge this person's existence, what will you do? You're not going to pick up the phone and call this person because you know that's going to be a two-hour, three-hour conversation talking about a breakup, whatever. The person you told this person not to date in the first place, and now they're wasting your time, you know, complaining about it. So what do you do instead? You text them. Sorry, I missed your call. No, you're not. That's why you're texting them. And you even TTYL them. They're not even worth a complete sentence. You're using an acronym. All these examples, what are you doing? You're economizing on time. So what's the moral of the story for you? If there are people in your life who you always call, always call, you even tell them, this is my window. Call me anytime between. And they choose to text you only. I'm not saying texting is bad, but if they are only responding by text, they're sending a signal to you that you're not worth their time. You're only worth a quick text. Now, maybe you've done that to others, but if someone is doing that or does that to you, that's a signal, in my opinion, that they, they are overly economizing on their time with respect to you. In plain English, they don't think you're worth their time. Uh, why do people date, as we talked about, various reasons, but let's focus on specifically the marriage reason. And by the way, some of my examples uh, might be more appropriate, you know, at the college level than at the high school level. So, but, you know, you're all teachers, so I'm using various examples here. But let's focus on marriage. Why do people date uh, using marriage as the example? So, you know, I had to throw in my bald buddy Vin there, right? Now, here's my story. Here's how I economize. I'll share this with you. I had never been married. Um, I had dated. This was now, like I told you, I'm going to be 53 in August. So go back in time. This is 2012. 
I was, uh, what, 40 years old or about to be 40, whatever, and uh, had dated, never been married, and everyone was trying to set me up. I think one of my high school classes was got, was literally uh, thinking about calling ABC and putting me on The Bachelor. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> With me, ABC's ratings would go down the tube. There would be no after the rose ceremony, right? So um, I always used the, the uh, Fast and Furious analogy, and here's what the, I mean by that. So now I'm 40 years old, and uh, one of my former high school students tells me he, he was a, he was a cop off duty that his classmate who was also my student. And now these people are 42 years old. So this is a long time ago. He tells me that, Oh, my friend, uh, Danielle told me to tell you that she thinks that her sister and you would be a good match. I'm like, here we go. Again, everyone's trying to set me up. You know, and I'm an only kid. So my mom was, you know, am I going to have grandkids? Would I'm like, leave me alone. It's okay to be single. You're too picky. Yeah, I like myself. I'd rather be single. So I said, okay, fine. I said, I'm open to it. And he said, Nino, so I, no, I know you. I really do think uh, you would be a good match for her sister. He, he knew her as well, who's now my wife. So, you know, the, it worked out. But I said to, uh, to this, um, to now my sister-in-law, I said, you know what? Sure, I'm open to it. I said, tell her to go to, uh, oh, after I looked at her Facebook, I had to see what she, I wanted to see what she looked like. You would do the same thing. Don't call me judgmental because one of the things that is important, not the only thing, not even the main thing, but is you want to be physically attracted to the person, right? I mean, I don't want my wife to say, Ninos is such a wonderful guy. He's such a great dad. But oh, that face. Wow. I mean, you want, you want some attraction, right? So after I looked, I said, okay. And I, I found out a little bit about her. What was important to me seemed to mesh. So I told my now sister-in-law, tell your sister to go to ninospalic.com. <laughs> now that website doesn't exist anymore, but it had a picture of my bald head. So if my now wife wanted the Paul Walker, who, who sadly passed away a few years ago, that, you know, blonde, you know, curly, wavy hair, clearly not. She liked the Vin guy. Maybe there was a chance. Plus, it gave a little bit of other information. Now, why did I do that? Because I valued my time. And this person who I didn't even meet yet, I respected her time. I was trying to economize on my precious, valuable time. So another story. And I'll come back to that, by the way. So now you're thinking about getting married. Or for those of you who are, you understand there's a cost. And I'm not talking money. Remember, get money and price, separate those. There is an opportunity cost to being married. Now, some of you maybe have seen this movie, uh, Old School, with uh, Vince Vaughn again and Will Ferrell, uh, Luke Wilson. And Will Ferrell's the one who's about to get married. And I'm not going to get into it. But, and again, you, don't, you might not want to show certain things. But uh, Vince Vaughn is basically telling Will Ferrell there is going to be an opportunity cost to being married. Now, of course, there are benefits. So you have to weigh both, right? It's always looking at both. Now, if you're only thinking about the cost, I can't be able to do this, I won't be able to do that, I can't, then maybe you shouldn't get married. That tells me that maybe you prefer being single. So what, there's always two sides. Make sure that you consider both before uh, you get married. All right, there we go. Sunk cost. Don't cry over spilt milk, right? That famous phrase. What's done is done. You can't change the past. You can learn from the past, but you cannot change the past. So stop beating yourself up if you made mistakes. Why did I do that? If I, you did, it was dumb. Just don't do it again. So what does that have to do with the with relationships? How, why do I say this concept can free you? And when I share this concept with my students, I have some students who, and I've done this for almost 20, 26 years in April will be how long I've been teaching, uh, since, since 1990, April of 98. I also share this sunk cost example, and there are some students with that face, not me, or not us. I had one class at De Anza College where it was apparent that they were a dating couple, and they looked at us when I was talking about potentially breaking up, like, not us. You don't know us. We're in love. <laughs> okay. At the end of the quarter, the girlfriend in this story sends an email. Dear Professor Malik, thank you so much. Great class. By the way, <laughs> we broke up, right? I'm like, okay, you're welcome. I don't know what to tell you. So there's some students, when I share this with them, there's the sunk cost example, the sunk cost fallacy. It's almost like there's, there's eyes of hope. Like, yes, student, you too 
can be free of that loser you're currently dating. It's okay to be single. And then there's those, there's going to be people you, you know, I've done this in various webinars, different age groups, high school, college, you know, uh, adults, teacher who sit there like, just like that angry. I'm like, why did you come to class anyways with that sour look? No one's going to want to date you anyway. So you can tune me out. I don't care. <laughs> so what does that have to do with this? I can't tell you how many times I've had people in my life, perhaps you have had the same. They've been in relationships for a long time, even though you have been telling them, everyone in their life has been telling them, he's wrong for you. She's wrong for you. You guys are not a good match. But what did they say? But if I don't marry this person, if, if, if he or she, you know, if, if we don't get together, we're not married, if we don't get a marriage, if I don't get a marriage ring out of this, if I don't propose these five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, even believe it or not, have been a waste right? It's like working on a research project. It's going nowhere, but you're like, no, I'm going to spend more time. Or if you're a business owner you're, or, you know, if, you know, it's in the business setting, putting millions of dollars into a project and it's going nowhere. And you're thinking I've put 20, we've put 20 million into this. We've got to put another, we have to make this work. You're trying to rationalize that investment of past time. And what economics teaches us is the only cost that should matter our future opportunity costs. So when there's people in my life, if I don't marry this person, these past five years, five, seven years, whatever, 10 years even, have been a waste as the nice, sensitive friend that I am, I say, I said, you're right. You did waste these years. Don't waste the future five or 10 or 15 years. What's done is done. It's sunk. It's a sunk cost. People who stick in these relationships that they know are bad, hoping that maybe it'll change to somehow rationalize the investment of time. So either that they don't look foolish or they don't feel like it was for nothing, you know, get my money's worth. And there's other examples of sunk cost is this falling into the sunk cost fallacy. Past cost should not come into the decision-making process. Only future opportunity cost should come into the decision-making uh, process. Pop culture example that you could use, or I think many of you know this, uh, Beyonce, and everyone still knows who Beyonce is. This is an old song. Uh, if Irreplaceable is the name of the song. If this is the current person you're dating, theme song for you, <laughs> uh-oh, this is not good, right? You must not know about me. You must know about me. I can have another you in a minute. And in fact, he'll be here in a minute. What's she basically saying? It's a concept that many of you teach called elasticity of demand. What Beyonce is basically saying to her current boyfriend is my demand for you is very elastic. One of the factors many of you know, if not all of you, that affects elasticity of demand is the number of substitutes, the number of options. So when Beyonce is singing, you must not know about me, you must not know about me, I can have another you in a minute. And in fact, you'll be here in a minute. You're impressed that I even know that by memory. <laughs> what she's basically saying is, buddy, you're not that special. I have a lot of options for you. So if you're that person on the other end of the song, <laughs> that's not good. On the other hand, uh, this is Fergie. Remember her? I think years ago she got creative with the national anthem. Um, and she was with the Black Eyed Peas with Will I Am. And this song, I Just Can't Get Enough. Remember? I think about it every night and day. I'm addicted. Um, you know, I'll want to drown inside your love. I just can't get enough. I just can't get enough. That's Will I Am's part. So if that is the theme song of the person you're dating, right? What is what are they saying? My demand for you is so inelastic. So when you hear people say there's no one else on the planet but you now, or there's only one you. Now I don't know why sometimes that's so romantic. That's just a fact, right? There's only one Nino Smalik, thankfully, right? But what that person is saying is my eyes are closed to everyone else. What they're saying is my demand for you is inelastic. Now, I'm not a relationship expert, I told you, but the problem with that is sometimes the other person can take advantage of that. So if someone you're dating, you keep hearing this and you might fall for this too. You're the only one, you're the only one. You're like God's gift to the planet. Sometimes that other person gets a little arrogant and starts treating the other person maybe with less consideration that they, they take them for granted. And it's amazing how, when that person starts realizing, oh, hey, you know what? Please don't treat me like that again. You better appreciate me or I'm out the door. It's amazing how they change their tune. So even understanding elasticity of demand in your personal life or as you share with your uh, friends and students can help you as well. 
All right. And you already, you know, the words to the Beyonce song. The only cost that should matter again are future opportunity costs. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, come on, PowerPoint, please, please, please. That's okay. I know this one by, there we go. Cut the tie. Cut the tie. Before you date someone, I've seen this with friends. Make sure your and his situation is very, is clean. In other words, you want to lower your opportunity cost. Make sure the person you're dating or thinking about dating is done, that they're not still hanging on, that there's no unsettled business left. I can't tell you how much that unsettled business comes back and then affects the current relationship. So whatever it is, sometimes you got to let person finish what they've started. Let them, you know, let them finish the chapter. Sometimes I've seen people enter into someone else's book instead of waiting for that book to be done. And then they complain, oh, you know, they have this going on, the ex is involved. I'm like, well, then why did you put yourself in that situation in the first place when you knew they were still in the middle of something and it wasn't concluded? I'm sorry, that that's on you. So make sure the other person, and for yourself as well, make sure, you know, it's a clean, fresh start that what's done is done before you start something new. Just some, some things that I've noticed in my life before jumping into another relationship. So after, let's say a relationship ends, you realize, you know, hey, it's on cost fallacy, I shouldn't fall for that. I have enough people in my life telling me this person isn't the right person. Before jumping into another relationship, take some time. I can't tell you on social media or way back in the day with, uh, remember, um, uh, what is it, MySpace and you know Facebook, in a relationship, single, one week later, in a relationship, I'm like, wow. Like, like, take a breath. It's okay to be alone for a little bit. Learn from what happened, you know, instead of trying to find that other person to fill some void. So don't rush. Keep calm. It's okay to be single. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with being single. Uh, there's benefits. There's costs, yes, but there are also benefits, things you can do. So a lot of, you know, before I was married, I had a lot of older people say, Nino, you know, take advantage of the time. I went to Europe for four times, nine weeks, backpacking, seven weeks. I can't do that now. I mean, I mean, I could, but I don't think it'll go over very well. Like, oh, yep, dad's gone for nine weeks. See ya. So it's, there's always an opportunity cost. There's always benefits, always costs, right? So before jumping into another relationship, take some time to make sure you are truly ready uh, before jumping in. Great book. Uh, actually behind me, it's called Spousonomics, Using Economics to Master Love, Marriage, and Dirty Dishes. Uh, and this gives you some nice examples of things that you perhaps teach, division of labor and specialization, um, understanding that just because um, you know how to do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. Just because you're the best at doing something doesn't necessarily mean you should. If you're the best at everything, doesn't mean you should do it all. You know, the, you, you know, your spouse should do other things too. Splitting, they, they argue, you know, even doing things half and half, which sounds fair, might not be an economically efficient use of time. So this is a great application of absolute and comparative advantage. If you remember, comparative advantage means I can do something at a lower opportunity cost than you. And the beautiful thing is you all have a comparative advantage over me in something. So if I do the thing I have a comparative advantage in, you do the thing you have a comparative advantage in, and we do what's called specialize, we both benefit. And we get more of both of the things, uh, most of the products that we're producing or the activities that we're doing. Uh, loss aversion, this is if you studied or, uh, you know, depending on the level that you're teaching, uh, behavioral economics. Uh, research shows that we hate losing more than we love winning. So, you know, behavioral economics shows us that, you know, we, we change our minds on a whim. We make rash decisions when we're losing. We choose lesser immediate gains over greater future gains. Uh, there's a great book called Economics in One Lesson by a guy named Henry Hazlitt. Look at the long run, not just the short run, okay? Uh, solutions, sleep on it, reframe the situation, be active in your decision-making, be careful about those spur of the moment decisions. Uh, there's a chapter on supply and demand. 
Uh, as you know, when the price of something goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. That's the law of demand. And um, they have a chapter on, on, on sex, which you can read more about if you want. The more it costs, the less you have. And it's an interesting application of cost. And it's not talking about uh, prostitution. Remember, cost means something else than price. Uh, moral hazard, you know, when you have insurance, you take more risks because you know you're basically going to be pulled out of the fire. And when you have this moral hazard, you know, playing with you, when you have this insurance, sometimes you're going to take uh, greater risks. So the optimal balance of moral hazard is don't be too whatever and don't be too much. On the other hand, whatever you say, whatever you say, there's an optimal level of being nice, but also not being a doormat. And plus, usually what I've heard anecdotally is the other person doesn't respect you if you're like, yes, okay, whatever you want, whatever you want, thinking that you're catering to the other person, they will lose respect for you. And that is important in a relationship, having both love and uh, respect. Uh, and then finally on this book, incentives, uh, praise is more effective than nagging, according to the authors, and giving incentives for your spouse to do something. Threatening to impose a fine can send a signal that you don't trust people. Like, if you don't do this, this will happen. Uh, forgiving and not doing this tit for tat uh, is something that actually is very beneficial. Sometimes love means loving someone when they don't, uh, you know, deserve it at that moment. Um, I've had, you know, numerous, you know, people, counselors, you name it. Um, I've heard, listened to in talks. Sometimes, you know, true love means loving a person even when they are not currently being lovable. Um, so it's not this tit for tat. Thoughtful gestures can be more effective than even material ones as well. And that depends on your love languages. And there's a book out there. Some people will read, some won't. That's called The Five Love Languages, which at least maybe you've heard of, right? Gifts and acts of service, etc. cetera. Uh, Trade-offs, you can't have it all. Please remember, you can't have it all. This is not the movie Weird Science. Some of you might remember this from the 80s. You can't program the perfect person. And, and honestly, even though our gut would love to have that person like programmed, that person is probably not the person we really want. We're not going to learn and grow uh, without some uh, differences involved. I'm almost done here. Uh, websites. Many years ago, some of you might remember, no one wanted to admit it. They met someone on a dating website, right? Only, you know, loser, nerdy people go on websites. Now people are proud and look at how the market, that's the beauty of the market. Not because they love me and you, but because they love themselves. They have a business. You have so many ways of economizing on time, specific to different things. I mean, there's farmersonly.com. In fact, there's a show on TV now, right? After uh, Next Level Chef, if you watch Gordon Ramsay, called, you know, Farmer Wants a Wife. So you name it, whatever it is, it's out there. And the benefit of these from an economics perspective is they help us economize on time. They help us discriminate, which a lot, you're like, what does that mean? Make choices. Some people, religion's important to them. Some people will only date someone of a particular religion. Okay. And that actually, if you're very religious, it kind of, it's nice if the other person has those same views because you're going to prevent a lot of problems later, right? Um, are you okay if we move? If I get a job and move? Um, do you want children? Do you not want children? How many times have you heard people getting divorced? Well, he wanted kids, she wanted kids. Like, didn't you talk about that when you dated for those seven years? Like, what the heck were you talking about? Get the big stuff out of the picture, right? Kids, no kids. Um, what about your philosophy of divorce? There's some who say, yeah, that's fine. Others say that word will never come out of our mouth no matter what. So from the beginning, you're both on the same page, whatever that might be. Uh, risk tolerance, hobbies. You know, some people are very, you know, adrenaline junkie types. Others are not. Now, that's fine, but if you have a philosophical issue with your husband or wife, you know, mountain climbing or doing Tom Cruise type of, uh, you know, stunts, because he really does his own stunts, and you're saying, hey, I think that's selfish if you're married and we have kids that you're doing that for the thrill of it, that's going to cause a lot of issues, because the other person might say, well, what's the point of living if you don't live on the edge? Other people might say, you know what, well, that's crazy. You know, it's not about you anymore. So you better get all this stuff figured out before. Don't wait for it to happen. So have these conversations uh, beforehand. You know, figure out what your deal breakers are. Figure out what your deal breakers are not. Uh, don't be too picky and unrealistic. Um, and also make sure you're not desiring qualities that are mutually exclusive, right? So uh, sometimes when people are single, I'm like, yeah, 
you're single because no human out there exists with what you want. So, but also don't be not picky as well. You know, give yourself some credit as well. And, you know, I love these, you know, the brain and the heart. I want, I want. Don't lose one without the other. Make sure you're using both. Uh, this is a famous, uh, in some circles, two animals pulling in different directions. You, you want to make sure that you're going in the same direction. Uh, it'll all work out. Love conquers all. No. He'll change. She'll change. You're not dating a project. If you want a project, go to Home Depot. If the person you're dating now already from day one, you want to change 50 things about them, hint. That's not the person, right? So figure out what your acceptable compromises are versus what your uh, deal breakers are. Remember the grass is greener where you water it. And if the grass is greener on the other sides, because there's probably more manure there. So I know our human nature is, well, maybe that's better. You don't see what the other situation really is. And I think you all know on social media, a lot of it is fake, all the smiles. And the next thing you know, that relationship is done. So be careful what you're listening in your ear. Uh, don't waste your time, your most precious resource. Date someone who already has the characteristics you want. Be honest with what you want. Uh, you know, uh, don't date a project, as I mentioned, who you want to change 50 things about them from day one. And some final thoughts. Um, don't confuse love with infatuation. You know, choice, commitment versus feeling. Uh, you might remember Tommy Lee, former uh, what, a drummer for Motley Crue and Pamela Anderson. I remember they got married. It was a big thing. And the, the vows were as long as we both shall love, not as long as we both shall live. So teach their own. I'm not imposing any moral judgments or whatever. That's, you know, everyone has their own philosophy of marriage, et cetera. But basically to me, that's an easy out because as long as I don't feel love anymore, it's okay. Very different than as long as we both shall live. So Whatever that is, make sure the other person is on your same page philosophically or whatever is important uh, to you. And so I hope this was helpful. Economics, again, is not just about money. It teaches about costs, benefits, how this can apply to your dating life, understanding opportunity costs, marginal thinking, uh, the marginal benefit, marginal cost, that X graph helps determine uh, when you should propose, when you should break up. Uh, so I hope you know you can bring to life for yourself and to your students how this subject is a real life subject. It's not just math and graphs, uh, you know, or dealing about the stock market, etc. A teaching resource is a paper a friend and colleague of mine wrote. You can find this online. Great resources using media, uh, pop culture, music, a lot of these topics we've talked about. So there's the URL, and I think you'll have access to these slides. And you're always welcome to email me if you have any questions. If I can ever be of help, please uh, don't hesitate. And then these are three books that might be very helpful. Uh, one I recommend, or I mentioned at the bottom, uh, Dollars and Sex by Marina Adshade. She's a professor at University of British Columbia. Uh, some interesting subjects about ratios at schools, the hookup culture uh, based on male-female ratio. A lot of, uh, again, maybe these were more adult examples, but for your own personal knowledge, this might be helpful uh, for those, you know, for the econ teachers. And this is a Stanford guy. Um, everything I ever needed to know about economics, I learned from online dating. Long title, but it's an interesting book as well. So with that, I will stop sharing. And again, I really apologize for your, uh, for this, this late start on my end, this tech issue, but thank you. Great. And I'm here for questions. Thank you, Ninos. Um, so if those of you who have questions, I would just say, please put them in the Q and A um, and we will um, happy to, to ask uh, Professor Malik for his answers. Um, so I've got a question. What, what is your favorite resource for recommending for maybe for a high school teacher to sort of talk about this? That's maybe maybe a little less. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You don't want to use, for example, talk about, you know, Katy Perry, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's like some of these kids don't know. But what I do teach them, though, kind of a version of that, what happens in Vegas might come back to San Jose. So you better be careful what you do. So the resource, honestly, that I provided at the end, that is online. That gives you a lot of choices of movies, music that you can use um, in terms of the books that I mentioned. Um those are going to have uh, some examples like the data, um, the Marine Adshade one, probably not at the high school level. Yeah. Um, uh, 
honestly, I, I came up with the Monday, Tuesday all on my own and I over these years and I just put these together and um, just started sharing them with, uh, you know, with, diff, you know, with Ted, with, you know, and others um, and with my students. Uh, so um, I'm happy to, you know, you know, give you some more insights, you know, if you send an email to me, but the books that I mentioned, I would say are the best. And, but as a teacher, uh, that uh, link that I gave to you that my colleague Charity joined, uh, she's at UT Austin now, uh, put together. I think that'll be very helpful, a very teacher friendly example um, with act with some, you know, discussion questions, et cetera. Good. Yeah. I think uh, there was uh, one of the questions was just asking the, for the slide with all the resources, but I think you have that. And we will, be posting Professor Malik's slide, uh, PowerPoint up on our website as well as a video recording. Um, Perfect. So if you do want to come back and, you know, for the participants who want to come back and see. Here's a yeah. question from Kyle. Uh, and this is not your econ. Well, I guess this could be a little econ re or relationship counselor. So pressure. <laughs> I'll try. That's okay. Uh, so it says, uh, what would you say is a reasonable gap between relationships? Again, you know, when I say benefits and costs are subjective, I don't have the magic answer. Like you must wait, you know, you break up, you must wait exactly 14 months. Look, I've, I've heard, read various books for different people. Some will say, depends on the relationship. If you've been married and of how long you've been married, maybe wait at least a year or so. I don't know. I'm just throwing out a number before you start. Make sure everything is resolved um legal whatever it is make sure again you have a clean slate i've seen this is anecdotal this has ended starting a new relationship a week or two or a few months later and you're still dealing with stuff now if you don't tell the other person what you're going through i don't think that's ethical because they don't know what they're getting themselves into and if the other person does know what they're getting themselves into, I don't feel sorry for either of you. Make sure, but that's me personally. I'm more risk averse. I don't want to deal with other issues. So, you know, for me, I don't have an exact time. If you were in a dating relationship for, let's say, four or five months and someone comes across your path maybe three, four months later, as an example, I think that's very different than if you've been married 10, 15 years and three months later, you're in another relationship. I don't think that's wise, but you know, that's just my, my answer. Good answer. Um, so here's a question for you. Um, how do you, uh, how did you come about balancing the marginal cost versus the marginal benefit of being a cowboy fan living in the Bay area? Oh gosh. Well, I, I, I was a Cowboys fan. I mean, my parents, so my, my, my mom was from Ecuador, South America. It's not Ninos, by the way, he grew up speaking Spanish. My father was Assyrian from Iran. So Ninos is an Assyrian name. So neither grew up playing, you know, watching football, like, well, football, yes, <laughs> not American football. And, uh, uh, I just started watching, you know, American football, little friends in first grade, though. I remember my first Super Bowl was Dallas versus the Pittsburgh Steelers. Dallas lost that one. And I just, like the Dallas Cowboys from that point on. Um, and then I, I remember Joe Montana and Dwight Clark, the catch. So all of my Niner friends, you know, so since then, um, I not only do I love Dallas, but I also love any team who plays the Niners. So I'm a lonely voice set. Well, not that lonely, but um, I was say, a this could be your last webinar with us. <laughs> but the Niners um, are a great team. You know, they were legitimately <laughs> a good team. So anyway, um, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, if we don't have any more any more questions, um, you know, uh, as you can see, uh, my colleague Molly has put um, a link to a survey in the chat, and we would just ask all your participants to please take a moment, go in, provide feedback um, for us and for Professor Malik, so you know he can get more information. I know he's always improving his talks and his teaching, um, and he may have mentioned this to you. You know, he I was looking up. Uh, when he attended one of the FTE programs, and I think it was around 99 or 2000. 2000, 24 years yeah. ago this July, UW, yeah, EFL. So for some of you younger uh, participants, maybe this could be your first step into becoming an econ professor. Um, yeah, it was a great, honestly, it was a phenomenal experience. One week, uh, great, two great professors, or, or one great professor, it was Daniel Benjamin at the time from Clemson, um, and small world, Al his book, Economics of Public Issues that FTE uses, 
Um, I, I've been using that since day one of teaching and have been able to review the book. So things come full circle. So get involved. FT has a lot of stuff, a lot of great teacher resources, lesson plans, especially if you're new, take advantage, borrow, borrow, borrow. It's okay. And again, if you want to send an email to me, San Jose State, Deanne's email, my hotmail email, let me know you were part of this and I'll be happy to, you know, give you any help I can. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you very much. I think that concludes our evening. So Again, for all the participants that jumped in, thank you so much. We appreciate your support. And again, Professor Malik, uh, thank you. And everyone have a great evening. Thank you.